Good morning. Today we're going to be talking about New England psalmody, which is generally agreed upon to be the first style of music that is specifically built here in the United, what's now the United States. There are roots, of course, in Europe where it comes from, but its own style is developed here in what's now New England. Psalmody is a particular type of sacred singing associated with the singing of psalms, which makes sense given the name. And it's nothing new. While we did talk about the three main avenues of colonial incursion, I guess you could call it, into what's now the United States in our last lecture, by far the one that has the most weight in terms of musical development in what's now the United States is the English Avenue. Okay, That's our 13 colonies and the Eastern Seaboard and all those things we associate with early colonial America including the Puritans and the Pilgrims. Now, one of the great myths about our country is that it was founded by people seeking religious freedom. It's true that the people who were known as Puritans when they came over here were a pretty extreme group of Protestants that had been persecuted first in England and then later on in the Netherlands where they had fled to from England. But these were not people who were coming over to a new world to say everyone should be able to do what they want for religion. At all. The Puritans were radical Calvinists. And their version of Christianity was incredibly strict. And anyone in their worldview that didn't match that strictness of morality was bad, or evil even, if you really want to be pedantic about it. The Puritans did not come to the United States, what's now the United States, seeking freedom of religion. They were seeking the freedom to practice their own religion, but not to guarantee freedom for everyone else's either. So that said, we can clear up that bit of a misnomer. The Puritans, like I said, are radical Calvinists. Calvinism is a branch of Protestantism. One of the early branches, in fact, you have Lutheranism and Calvinism. And Calvinism is centered mostly in Northern France into what's now the Netherlands and Belgium. Calvinism is a much, much, much stricter interpretation of Protestantism than either Lutheranism or Anglicanism, which come about in a similar time period. It has very, very strict versions of morality. One of those things is that music and song are only meant to be used for explaining or glorifying the word of God. So instrumental music, not allowed. And dancing, not allowed either, by the way. So all of these things that we heavily associate with religious music from Protestant areas like England or Germany, not so much with the Calvinists. And when the Puritans came over, they were the most Calvinist of all the Calvinists. So remember that music here, only for God, no one else. It's not about enjoying it yourself. It's not about having a good time. It's not about being beautiful. It's about glorifying God. And that's it. All right. I think we made that point. So we have our Puritans coming over. And they bring with them their own psalm books. Psalm books are nothing new. A lot of them are taken from the Anglican hymnology. Hymnology is the study of hymns. And changed slightly but not all that much. The problem comes with the Anglican hymnology that they're borrowing from was an educated tradition. It meant that people actually had to have some sort of training in singing and in music in order to effectively sing those hymns. That was fine in the early days because people still had training from before they were radical Calvinists. But as the generations went on and it became not really allowed to train people in singing and not really allowed to train people in reading music, the hymnology of the Anglicans became less 
desirable because it was hard and it still is by the way that sort of hymnology requires training and training in music was not allowed this leads to a phenomenon we hear about in New England psalmody called lining out lining out is just what it sounds like you have the one person in the congregation who actually reads music and they sing the lines to the congregation and that's how they teach it. I sing, you repeat. And it's a very characteristic style. You, If you've ever been exposed to kind of very traditional Methodism or very traditional Lutheranism or Episcopalianism, you're going to get used to this. This is how that starts. Now, that lasted for quite a while all the way up into the middle of the 17th century, kind of 1680, 1690. But in the beginning of the 17th century, or the 18th century, excuse me, we have something a little different starting. This is what we have described as regular singing. Now, regular singing doesn't mean like this is the normal way. It means it is kept regular, meaning it has training. So regular singing actually comes out of the non sacred tradition from New England. Now, there wasn't much of a secular tradition up there amongst the Puritan communities, but the important thing to remember is that not everyone who lived in the 13 colonies was a Puritan. In fact, most of them weren't. Puritanism was, was really a radical branch of Christianity. And even when you have things like the Mayflower and the, all these things that we hear about, the majority of the people on the Mayflower were not Puritans. Majority of them were just people looking to come and start a new life. For whatever reason. A lot of times that reason was money, as it is now. So, secular music definitely existed. And was quite popular, except for amongst the Puritans. And eventually, secular music started to make inroads into Puritan sacred music, into the psalms, the psalm singing of New England because it meant that things could sound a little better in a lot of ways. Training meant, means that things could be more nuanced and more complicated, and generally means that the quality of singing is higher. That's why we train. So it's not really a surprise that the secular music started infringing upon very traditional Puritan psalmody. Regular singing is nothing particularly fancy, it just involves teaching people how to read music so that you don't have to have someone else do it first. And that's it. This is happening mostly in what we call singing schools. And while psalm books were published in the United States, what's now the United States, I should say, excuse me, when published in what's now the United States, from pretty much the first things that were being published here, they were all about the text until 1712, when you have an introduction to singing and music, which is kind of the first music book written in the United States, or was now the United States. Not actually, because the psalm books before had music in them, but it was the first book primarily focused on psalm tunes. This is the first place where the text is less important than the music. And this is a big deal, like a big deal to the point that the Puritans called the author a heretic. This is a turning point for American music because this is one of the first books that is almost entirely written by an American, not a European. It's not the first because there are some things left over from the Anglican uh, hymnology in there, which of course came from England, but it's getting there. The first actually comes from William Billings. Now, Billings is a composer you may have heard of if you've ever been familiar with either the Lutheran or the, or the Methodist or the Baptist hymnologies. If you've ever heard Chester, for example, that's William Billings. Uh, a Mighty Fortress of Our God is Our God. That's an older hymn, but the tune used now is William Billings. All the really famous hymns you're going to kind of associate with New England, associate with 
you know, old American religious practices. That's all William Billings. William Billings is the first one to write a book in what's now the United States of music entirely written by someone from America. And it's a really important point for us because it gives us a glimpse into what American music in the 1760s was like. And this isn't the 1760s, it's, you know, 50 years after the first of this kind of pattern of writing new hymn music and focusing on the music instead of the text is starting. But William Billings is kind of the codifying moment in the 1760s. So that's a name you should remember, William Billings. In terms of what it actually sounds like, you've probably heard this. This is the very traditional Protestant American sound, New England psalmody. It's simple, it's open, it's very clear, it's in English. This is an important point because in other areas, particularly in areas of the Southwest where there's a heavy Catholic influence or areas up North where the French were having influence along the Great Lakes, it wasn't in English. Not only because the main colonizing forces didn't speak English, they spoke Spanish or French, but because it's Roman Catholicism. And Roman Catholicism has a very interesting relationship with what we call vernacular language, the language of whatever people are in that area. In fact, the translation of the Bible into German was one of the first things that separated Catholicism from Protestantism, which in this time period was not that long ago. It was only about 200 years before. So in Catholic areas, you still have a lot of Latin. And then secondary to that, you'll have your local language, whatever that may be, according to the colonizers. And then after that, you'll have whatever languages were spoken already. Okay? In English colonies, it's Protestant and English is the de facto language. That's just what it is. And that really is very different. So whenever you're hearing kind of very simple open harmonies, so nothing too complicated, nothing too dissonant or hard to listen to, very clear, and it's in English, you're probably listening to New England psalmody. All right, and that's what we're going to talk about for today. On Monday, we're going to be going into secular music in colonial America prior to the Revolutionary War. So that's dance music and regular popular songs and things like that. And then by the end of, the next, of next week, we're going to be uh, a nation already. Hope you have a good weekend, and I will see you next week.